record again tonight because we had uh, quite a few people that had listened to the last one, so I thought, you know, what the heck, we'll just uh, go ahead and uh, record the Wednesday nights and just see how that goes uh, as well. And so that is kind of the plan here for, for what we're going to do this evening. So let's open up in a word of prayer, and then uh, we'll begin and uh, get into our time of study, all right? Father, we come to you this evening, and we just pray, Lord God, that you would just you know, clear our minds, settle our spirits, busyness of the day, ideas, thoughts, whatever we're dealing with, bringing them into the building tonight, and just for this next hour, just to kind of lay those aside so that we can hear your voice, we can uh, hear your word, we can let your spirit speak to us. So, Father, anoint our time together, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. All right. Okay, we left off last week, I'll make sure that I get into the right spot here. I had us leading us last week on Romans chapter 20. Romans. 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 That guy did the right one. Luke. <laughs> Luke chapter 21. When's the next test? Yeah, really. <laughs> Luke chapter 21 beginning at verse 16 is where I think I have us leading off at, and so that is where we are going to begin. I yeah, so I got, <laughs> she takes yeah. notes, so she said yes, that's Okay, right. that is right. See, oh, you right. pay attention. Somebody pays attention. I'm glad that they do. Well, if you throw out the wrong book, you know, it's been one day, that's all there is to it. Okay, so remember now, Jesus is talking here. Uh, we looked at the signs of Christ coming, that was in the ones before that, 8 through 12 and so on there. And now we're looking at when they're going to throw them into synagogues and the destruction of Jerusalem and all of those things taking place. The kind of the build up to all of that, and then we're going to look at the actual events that Jesus prophesied, of course, did to come to pass in uh, 70 AD. When the Romans, that's where my brain was, when the Romans uh, destroyed Jerusalem. So, so I want you to see what is going on here and what is taking place. And you have to also realize, I mean, part of this is part of the last days also. I mean, we could see some of this going on now uh, in the world around us. So, I mean, this is for that time. But yet some of the events that are going to take place here uh, will be taking place as we get closer to the last days, even for ourselves. But we'll keep it in the, in the context here of verse 16. He says, so they're going to betray you. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends, and they will send some of you to your death. So this is that anger that is going to be raised up. This is the people betraying them, turning them over to the Roman government, turning them over to authorities. Uh, if you remember when uh, we read Acts uh, with Paul, uh, you know, he was a Jew. His fellow Jews were, uh, you know, making accusations against him. He was thrown in prison several times, accused of causing rioting and all this other stuff. Uh, you know, they weren't opposed to, you know, going after, uh, you know, Paul and making accusations that were not true after him. And we see this the same here. And he says, so what's going to happen? He says, people are going to betray you. People are going to betray you. And if it's going to cost money, if they get money for it, they will do that. If it means that they'll save their own life to turn you in, they will do that. So that is exactly what he is telling them here. He says, you're going to be betrayed by these people. Verse 17, you will be hated by all for my name's sake. The word hated simply means this. It means to be despised. Paul is saying, Paul, Jesus is saying that you are going to be hated because of me. Now, obviously it was taking place then. Because uh, again, if you remember in Acts, when, uh, when Paul got the letters from the priest to go you know, around and, and arrest the Christians and bring them back for trial. I mean, that's how much they were hated. And that was going on even then. Again, Paul, throughout the whole New Testament, we see where people persecuted for Christ. That was going on then. That is going on now. And we see it taking place now. You know, we're, we're, we're looking at countries around the world that are turning against the Christians. We're seeing different religions raising up and overpowering the Christian beliefs, Christianity. Uh, we see that taking place. Uh, you see the Muslims and the Hindus, uh, you know, they don't like each other, but they hate Christians also. So, you know, you kind of see this kind of kind of rising up again now where obviously people are turning against the Christians. And that's what he says, for his name's sake. He says, they're going to hate you. Now notice what he says, verse 18. But not a hair of your head 
shall be lost. Okay, so the word here, the idea here, this phrase, it isn't literally the hair on your head. It is this. It is uh, the your eternal soul will not be lost. In other words, this isn't a promise that you're not going to die. It is a promise that you will not lose your eternal salvation. Go ahead, Al. Uh, in, in those verses there, the 16th there, it says, You shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinfolk and friends, and some of you shall be called to be put to death. And then it says, uh, and then uh, go to 18, the well, 17, it says, And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sakes, just as you read. But then on 18 here, there's kind of a, uh, a, a puzzle, puzzle, uh, I take it as a puzzled verse here, and he says, and you shall, and, but there shall not an hair of your head perish. Right. Uh, is he talking about two different groups of people here? Because in, in 16 he said, they'll call some of you to be put to death, and then in 18 he says, but there shall not be a hair of your head perish, right. meaning that, that you, 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 they won't touch you. Well, yeah, right, but that doesn't mean that. Uh, in, the, in the Greek, the word perish is the loss of eternal life. I, I never life. understood the, that, that verse in right. comparison to yeah. 16. Right, so the Greek is perish is the loss of eternal life. It okay. isn't well, this current life. I mean, I know it reads like yeah. that. Well, to me, that would take physical death. You know, well, well, yeah, and it's not promising you won't die. Right. It's not, it's not a promise that you won't die. It is a promise that you won't lose your eternal soul. Yeah. But it says here they will cause you to be put to death. Right. Yeah. Physi I'll, I'll take that as physical death. It is physical death. Yeah. Right. And then in 17, he said, you shall be hated of, uh, of all men for my sake. Right. And now, is that where the spiritual part of that comes in, where mm -hmm. when you stand before God, you... No, but no, this is all literal. I mean, it is them standing before the Lord, getting betrayed, or standing before, you know, magistrates, governors, and the stuff that we have seen up at the, up at the beginning of these passages of Scripture. But as you're reading it, and I'm, I'm with you, because when you're reading it, if you take it literal, it looks like it's contrary yeah, to no, each other. Really but like I said, it's, it's not. So, so you're hated by all these men, and you will be put to death. So the phrase in 18, the phrase but not a hair of your head shall perish. It means the, it means the loss of eternal life, not the physical okay. hair of your head. So it yeah. has more of a spiritual sense to it. That part is right. Like, that part is a spiritual. This is your. You will not lose your eternal soul or your life. Your eternal. You know you're going to live for eternity. So you're not going to lose that, but you might lose your physical life. Right, just like now, you know, if we die, if I die tonight, I've lost my physical life, but I'm going to go live with the Lord for eternity. Right. And so that's what that means in the Greek. So yeah, I, I thought it was kind of interesting too. So this is not a promise that people won't die. It is a promise that you'll have your salvation when you do die. Okay. That's what the word well, perish. It makes more sense than, than, than trying to figure it out from the, well, the physical yeah. sense. Right, right. And, and that's what the word of the Greek means there for the word the perish. perish. talking that is translated in Greek. Says that what word? The word perish. Perish. Yep. The word perish in the Greek is not a promise that you will not die. It is a promise that you will not lose your eternal soul. That's the promise. That's what it means in Greek there for the word perish. And it helps clarify it, you know, because when you read it, you know, there's a couple other it's verses in here too. Yeah, when you read them, you go, that doesn't, how, how does that line up? Because this verse says this, but this one now says this, and it looks like they're contrary to each yeah. other. And then when you look at it, you realize what perished means, and uh, that's what it does. I don't know if you got a, you got a different translation, like in the... Uh, Mine says perish. Yeah, uh, is there any footnote with it? No. No, yeah. And yeah, that makes sense. So that you will not perish. Okay, so look at verse 19 then. In your patience... All right, and the word patience here means in your endurance, in your steadfastness, and holding on, you know, to the promises of God. And your patience possesses, your patience possesses your souls. And the word here, possesses of soul, is this. It, and so it's the phrase, okay, the phrase possess your soul. Soul is this true life of your soul, your eternal life. He says, so you hang in there, you endure, it may cost you your life. If it does, that's fine. You're going to go home and be with the Lord. But if you'll hang in there and endure, you know what? You will possess your soul. And those you will possess that eternal life. I do have a footnote in mine. 
Well, go ahead. No, that's why you mean you're by your perseverance, you will secure your lives. Yeah, perseverance. Perseverance, steadfastness, that you but now mine says soul, and the word soul is again that idea, the same as the next last verse. It's an eternal thing, not something that you're gonna get a grip on now. Go ahead, Rhonda. Standing firm, you will gain life. Yeah, see gaining life would be the Eternal. Would be eternal life. Correct. Go ahead. Uh, mine says, although persecution and death may come, God is in control, and the ultimate outcome will be eternal victory. Yeah. Not a hair on of your head will perish. In view of verse 16, this cannot refer to physical safety. The figure indicates that there will be no real, i.e., spiritual and eternal loss. Right. See, that's it. The spiritual yeah. loss, the eternal life. That, that's yeah. exactly it. Yeah, that's what it means in the Greek as well. Those are good. Thank you for sharing those. I appreciate that. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at verses 20 through 24, and we're going to read through them. Now, this is the destruction of Jerusalem. And so this is Jesus prophesying this taking place, uh, the destruction of Jerusalem. We had mentioned it at the beginning of this, and so we're going to bring it up again. And then I'm going to read some footnotes concerning the destruction of Jerusalem because it happens exactly how Jesus says it's going to happen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and read this. And now remember as I'm reading this, at 66 AD, the war really actually starts beginning between the Jews and the Romans. I mean, they start mounting armies and coming after each other in 66 AD. In 68 AD, the Romans have had enough. And they send four Roman legions to surround the city of Jerusalem. And so when you, when he says this about laying siege to the city and surrounding it, that's what he's talking about. And that's literally what happens. And when you read this, the idea is, is if you're outside the city, don't go back in because that's where it, that, it's going to fall. You know, if you have to flee, go ahead and flee. And so this is Jesus prophesying about the destruction of Jerusalem. And so with that in mind, uh, you know, let me read this to you. But when you, see, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that the desolation is near. It's exactly what the Romans did. Then let those in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart. And let not those who are in the country enter her. And I'm going to pause here a second. And one of the commentaries I read that almost all of the Christians by now had left Jerusalem because of this prophecy. They knew it, they remembered it, and the, a lot of them fled and just went out around the world, you know. And so just kind of throw that in as a reminder so they remembered that. Verse 22, for these are the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. For there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into the nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And I'll explain the time of the Gentiles here. Uh, in just a second. So Jerusalem falls in 70 AD, but here are some of the events that had taken place. Over the years, the Roman government and the people that were in charge of Jerusalem and in that area around there that worked for the Romans, uh, they became more vicious, they became more dishonest, they became more violent to the people. The rebellion broke out in 66 AD. And so that's when the Romans kind of started feeling we got some problems here with these guys. A group of zealots, which Peter was one before he came to Christ, and they were kind of like the uh, secret Jewish assassins. You know, the zealots would put daggers, they would wear robes, and they would put daggers in the back of their robe. And when they would come up, they could come up behind a Roman soldier and they knew where to put the knife in between the uh, armor of the soldier so that they could kill him. So they could come into a crowd, slip the knife in, slip it out, go through the crowd, soldier would collapse and no one would ever know who did it because they were already gone. That was how the zealots uh, operated, okay? So when all of this was taking place, obviously the people of Israel got upset about it. The Romans didn't like them rebelling against them. So they mounted a siege on Masada 
They took over Masada, and then that group went into Jerusalem to have a battle with uh, the Romans. So what happens then is that when this news starts spreading around, a lot of the Jews who were in high positions in different places in different cities like Caesarea and some of those places, they murdered them. You know, the Romans just killed them. They were Jewish. Your people are rebelling. Boom, you're done. And they went ahead and they killed them. So then what happened is, is the revolt begins in 66. In 68, uh, Nero dispatches Vespasian to go down and put the revolt down. So that's where he was at. And, he, and they isolated the city of Jerusalem and put it under siege. In other words, just like this says, they surrounded the city and you're under siege. You know, even commentary said that, you know, the siege lasted two years. It started in 68, it'll fall in 70. Uh, they actually started committing cannibalism. You know, because there was nothing going in, nothing going out. So, I mean, it was a, it was a very, a very brutal time. Well, then in 69 AD, Nero committed suicide. Vespasian, who was in charge of the armies, he left to go become the emperor of Rome and left his son Titus to be the one to finish off the job that needed to take place. They had four legions of Roman soldiers. Now, roughly a legion is between four and 6,000 men. So there was between 16 and 24,000 Roman soldiers that had surrounded the city of Jerusalem and you know, those people weren't going out, they weren't coming in, they weren't going anywhere. So on August the 5th, 70 AD, the walls fell, the armies, the Roman soldiers marched in, they burned the temple down, they carried, uh, they carried out all of the things that belonged to the temple that they could take, uh, they slaughtered everybody along the way, uh, some of the Jews went to go hide in their last stand at Herod's palace, uh, but the end obviously was inevitable. Titus ordered that the entire city be destroyed and burned to the ground, and that was all that was done. Jews were executed or taken off into slavery, and so Jerusalem fell. And it is exactly how Jesus described it in 20 through 23. And then Jesus says something interesting in verse 24. It talks about the time of the Gentiles. And now this is also part that you'll find in the Old Testament, uh, different places in the Old Testament as well. So when you hear about the times of the Gentiles, let me give you a, a, a definition of what it means here, okay? And, uh, and I'm going to read it again here just so that it refreshes your memory. And they, were, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away into captive, which is exactly what happened into all the nations. Yep, they were scattered everywhere. Jerusalem will be trampled uh, by the Gentiles. And remember, other than the streets and a few things, um, I mean, the entire place was destroyed. You know, that is why, and I shared with you last time, but just remember, that is why uh, the Wailing Wall is so precious to the Jewish people because that is the last place where the temple stood. I mean, that's part of the courtyard of the temple. And right now, where the temple was, that is where you see the Eleazar Mosque, you know, the Dome of the Rock? That is where the Jewish temple stood. And then right across the courtyard from there is another mosque as well. And so when you go up the steps and you stand in the courtyard, instead of being there at the temple, uh, you are here where the Jew two Muslim uh, buildings are at. And so all the Jews have is that courtyard and then what's left of the wall, and they call, obviously call it the Wailing Wall because of the destruction that had taken place. And so uh, that's the only part that you see. So I mean, when he said it would be nothing, not a stone left standing, yep, that's exactly what happened. You know, they went through and destroyed it. So this is gonna happen until the times of the Gentiles. Now, the times of the Gentiles began when Babylon, with the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC, and the exiled Jewish people were taken into captivity. So the time of the Gentiles means that the Gentiles will be ruled over by 
Gentiles over the Jews. They're not going to have their own nation. They're not going to. They're going to be under someone's authority. They've been under the Babylonians. They've been under the Persians. They've been under the Romans. You know, they, they've never they've never been under their own authority until the last seventy three years. And right now they're under the, the guise of the United Nations, basically, and us because we we offer protection for them whenever they get attacked. We're the ones that uh, so far under. I want to bring the modern politics into it, but at least under the Trump administration, right. he's looked out for them the last four years. Yeah, what's happened is that I mean, the Jews have a tr the Jewish army is a, they have a really good military now. I mean, like in the 60, 70, Seven Day War and some of these other ones, you know. And then plus we sell them a lot of their missile defense stuff. So, but they've got a top notch army with some really good stuff going on. And I think that's the reason. Uh, when, I think it was a sixty seven war. That they had, they captured the Golan Heights in the northeast corner of, yep. of Israel. Trump said they, under his administration, they'd never have to give it back because they, they got a fair and square. Because they were the ones that were aggressed upon. And what was taken at the end of the fight belonged to them. Yeah. And so, so I don't know what Biden's going to do with it. But well, at this point, it really isn't going to be up to the states as much, even with even well, with. It was because it's not like about I don't know because I I also watch Channel Seven Israeli news and it's a Christian Jewish they not Christian Jewish news channel in Jerusalem and uh, they were sending rockets over there tonight from the Arab side of that into into Israel yeah. uh, you know and so that fighting is is just going on so the American administration at this point isn't going to be a whole lot of help, just to be honest with you. And they really don't need it. I mean, I mean, like I said, they've got a top notch. What they're needing is Americans to be a part of the peace process and help keep the peace uh, in there is what they needed. But tonight they're shooting rockets over on there. So, so you know, it's already getting precarious what's going on. But, but, but what's nice about what the idea here is this is that there's always been these uh, Gentiles that have been lording over and ruling over Israel. And that all ended with the Balfour Declaration in 1948. Let me let me hone this down, and then Alvin, if you got another question, then. So, so basically, the Jewish people, Israel, no longer independent nation, but was under the control of Gentile rulers. And of course, in the day of Jesus, it was the Roman Empire, and that fell in 70 A.D. So Jesus was saying that the domination of God's people by his enemies would continue until God decided that it was going to end. And the times of the Gentiles refers to not just the, the, the repeated destruction of Jerusalem, but also the persecution that they have been under. So in the Belfort Declaration, now I have a book about the size of an encyclopedia, I read through the Jewish history stuff, but here's the bottom line. In 1909, the, they started talking about this thing called the Belfort Declaration. All right, it took them 30 years to pull together how it was gonna unfold and work so that the Jewish people could have a piece of Israel and have their land, that's, that's kind of what happened. Actually, during that time, uh, Jew, the Jewish people, Israel was really under the leadership of England. They were, that was English, it was an English, like an English colony, I mean, so to speak, you know, so it belonged to England. So, through the Belfort, Belfort Declaration, England, on May the 14th, 1948, lowered their flag in the city of Jerusalem and then raised up the Jewish flag and it became an independent Jewish state for the first time in thousands and thousands of years. So now, from 19, 1948 till today, it's been 73 years that they have not been under directly under or ruled by another person. So that is important because Jesus said that's a sign. When you see them becoming an independent state, then things are starting to pull together and be part of the last days. And so that's when it came together and that's how important it is. Uh, I thought it was interesting, and you can't make count numbers because everybody's you know trying to figure out when Jesus is coming back and predicting numbers, but my buddy Amir, uh, he had one of his teachings that I had listened to, and he talked about a, a generation. 
And you know, all of these theologians in America, you know, we can try to figure out what a generation is. You know, this generation shall not come to pass. But there's a couple of meanings. But if you want numbers, Amir uses Psalm 100 and something, and I don't know exactly what it is, but he says a, a generation to the Jew is 70 to 100 years. And they're using that psalm as the reason why they look at a generation uh, in those sites as opposed to how we try to figure out what a generation is. I thought that was interesting. So any footnotes or anything in your Bibles? Al, you want to throw anything? I know you keep well, up with that. I'm talking about the Golden Heights. Uh, ever since they conquered that, yeah, I think it was 67, uh, my, my memory served me correct, and we had a couple of, of what they call minor wars over there. But the Golden Heights has been heavily military fortified so they can keep an eye on Syria and they can keep an eye on Iran because Iran is their big threat now if, they go, uh, if uh, our government uh, goes through with allowing Iran to keep enriching their uranium so they can come up with a bomb, that's probably where it's going. That's, that's the direction we're going to launch it from, uh, would be my guess. Well, the one thing nice about, and that's exactly right, the Golan Heights is the great lookout point it is. for it what is. is going on around, and that's why it was so important to them. Uh, but tonight on that news, when they were showing the bombings and stuff, uh, they also included in the report that there is now a large contingent of the Al Qaeda's that are in that same, you know, in Iran, right. in Iraq, right. yeah. to those countries close up there, so they can see what you know what Israel is doing. And, and so the thing with is, is Syria is not really a country anymore. Assad is still there, but he has no power as to who comes in and goes out. Yeah, he's busy fighting the war yeah, with yeah, everybody yeah, else. Yeah, you know? civil, right. Actually, a, a state of civil war in Syria. Right. So, so there's no control over it. anybody can go in there and shoot rockets into Israel. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and they're coming in and they're doing that. They are. Uh, but again, it's all you know. But you get it all pieced together and you see all this stuff taking place and and how you're looking because we're going to see here in a moment when Jesus takes a look at the fig tree. And of course, Amir says, "I'm telling you, the fig tree is Israel." So there you go. There's another thing that that he says, you know, coming from a Judaic perspective. Uh, you know, on everything. So that tells you there. So, so it's been about 73 years. They've had their independence. They have had. They have. They've been fighting and having wars and people against them. Yes, but nobody is ruling over them, like what was happening during the Roman Empire, Persians and Medes and all that kind of stuff, which is the point. Okay, 25, 26, and 27 and 28. Now this is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Okay, this is not the rapture. The rapture has already taken place. However. Again, there are some signs here that you can look at and go, wow, you know, how much it pertains to today, which is true. And again, then that should kind of make you think, well, man, you know, maybe we are in the last days. You know, you know maybe, you know, we need, to, we need to see what's going on. So, so 25, 26, 27, and 28, the rapture has taken place. And this is Jesus saying, this is when I am coming back. And here are the signs. And there will be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the seas and the waves are roaring. You know, obviously tidal waves and all those things are going on. 26, men's hearts failing them for fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Again, you can see some similarities to the stage being set where we're at now. Then, 27, then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and with great glory. And remember, when he is coming back, we're coming back with him. I mean, this is the armies of heaven, and he's going to come with power and glory. So the rapture, he's just taking us out. You know, he doesn't touch the earth. He doesn't come to the earth again. So his first coming was at his birth. Second coming is when he touches earth again. That is when you have the battle of Armageddon and all those things taking place. So he's telling them, you know, you need to watch for these things. So these are the people that, you know, they're waiting, looking for the second coming. And you got to remember, again, keeping it to a Jewish perspective, there are 144,000 sealed of God that are on this planet during the tribulation period. So if you're thinking, well, who'd be looking for them? Well, don't think Americans. 
Don't think like Americans as we think, you know, we always think through our Gentile mindset, you know, you know, why would they, you know, who's going to be looking for them? The 144,000 sealed of God that did not bow to the Antichrist. And those are Jews, right? So he's talking to them, to those people, hang in there, and when you see these coming, I'm coming back. So we got to remember, so that's who it's for, okay? Uh, so now 28. Now when these things begin happening, look oh, one of Mike's favorite verses, look up and lift up your head because your redemption draws near. So he says, when you see these happening, I am coming in power and I'm coming in glory. I'm taking care of business. All right, any, any two cents on that one? Any thoughts? No. It could be any time now. Oh, it could be any time now. <laughs> <laughs> Amen, brother. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of things happening that is for sure okay so verse 29 through 33 is the parable of the fig tree and as I said I, uh, I've been, I, I bought one of Amir's books and trying to get some stuff you know, concerning the last days and, he's, and he comes, actually uses this verse and he says the fig tree is Israel so he says Jesus is saying look at Israel because it's a parable and, and he's saying, we're taught as Jews, you know, Christian Jews, this is a parable, but it is, we are the fig tree. So maybe keep that in mind as we're going through this. So he spoke to them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they are already budding, you see and know for yourselves the summer is now is near. Verse 31. So you likewise, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. And so what's happening? All of these things that he had just mentioned there. So he said, look for these things. Here are, here are the signs that you're looking for. And then verse 32. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will be by no means pass away till all things are fulfilled. Now, I'm going to tell you what a generation, what this means here, this generation, the phrase here, and what I like about it, because when you read this, it sounds like Jesus is talking to them, telling them, you guys, this generation will not disappear, <coughs> and yet they're long gone. <laughs> yeah. you know, 2,020 years, they are gone. You know, there's no doubt about it. Okay. And, and it is for this verse, the word this generation is this, those living at that definite period in time. That's what it means in the Greek. Yeah. Those living at that definite period in time. It, it could read, surely I say to you, that generation will by no means pass away. In other words, that generation that will see these signs, they won't pass away. But when you read the word this generation, you and I look at it through our eyes and go, okay, that means, you know, because if I say this generation, we're all going to go, okay, this generation, not one 2,000 years from now. <laughs> I don't, don't want to go against what the scriptures say because they say what they say in the Bible say in Sunday school class. But there was certain words and things that, that uh, the, the uh, scholars, when they, when they wrote, translated the scriptures and put it into English from the Greek, that uh, they, they couldn't put distinctly so it would indicate certain periods of time. So they used what they had. Same way with numbers. You don't see millions and billions in the scriptures. You see multitudes. Right. Thousands. Hundreds, right? And I, I've often wondered if that maybe was one of those little glitches that they didn't catch up on with that. Yeah, because, yeah. because it, 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 if you read it just as it is written, you would think, well, man, that happened two thousand years right. ago. How can that apply today? Well, a lot of mistranslation would would explain it. Well, yeah, and it's just one word, but it but it creates a confusion as you're reading it, it because you're reading it as though it should have happened with that generation right. without Absolutely. understanding that. But the thing, and, and like you said, I know you're not you know, discrediting anybody, but when they were tasked with doing the interpretation, you know, they weren't 
you know, ordered to be Greek scholars and no. break it down like I do, you know, they're, 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 the, the task is to, to make this as close to the language as you possibly yeah. can translate it to. It. Right, and, and that's why we have what we have today. And so when you get into, like when I take it down into the Hebrew, into the Greek, you know, then you get into these deeper meanings of the words, but that wasn't their job, you know, when King James put out the King James Bible, or, you know, the scholars started translating it, their job was to bring it in so that people could read it and use it. I mean, they went for accuracy, but, you know, you know, like when I do a study like this in Luke, and I got paid this many pages from two years of doing this stuff, well, that would have been just the book of Luke. I, you know, <laughs> you'd be carrying a Bible around this high. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and the thing is, remember, and it's not a mistake. I mean, you're not saying there's mistakes. It's just that's the word they used, and you and I interpret it through our mindset. This meaning now, but in the Greek, it doesn't mean that. It means those living at that definite period in time. Yeah. Well, it's they had to use what they had at that time to describe it. Right. And, and, they, and though they were limited, uh, it, it makes us kind of scratch our heads and say, well, what time period are we talking about? Right, right. yeah, and just that word, four, four letters. Yes. Go ahead, Rhonda. Well, I think their language then was more concise to actually what God meant. They didn't have to have 20 words to describe one word. Well, especially the Jews, I mean, the Greek, you know, the Greek, well, even the Hebrew, you know, the, they don't rattle on like we do. <laughs> and they don't have, uh, you know, five meanings for one word. You know, you can say, I love my car and I love my wife. Well, hopefully it's two different kinds of love. Uh, you know, there's four Greek meanings for love in the, in, you know, uh, in the Greek language. There's four different meanings, and each one has a different meaning to it. So, so you know, they, they weren't going for, okay, now which one do we use here? You know, and they were, they, you know, they were concise. You know, and so when you look at that and you read it, it's just that we read it through our eyes and we go, this generation, well, that's already done. And people say, oh, there's a mistake in the Bible. It's not a mistake in the Bible. You know, it's just we need to understand when he says this, it's the generation that he's talking about here for the second coming, not the generation that he was talking to. Mm -hmm. Very good. Anyone else? Well, that's what I've always been taught is when it, it's when Israel becomes a nation because behold the fig tree. Right. It's been desolate up to 1948. Yeah, yeah. So and that's true. about this generation. Yeah, yeah. Right, and it'd be this generation, that's why Amir says 70 to 100 years, and they're in 70, 30 years. You know, 70, yeah, 70, 30 year of this, you know. <laughs> you say 70. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, well, I say right now, I looked up two years ago, for the women it's 75, for the men it's 73. That's a generation today in the Israeli lifespan. Okay, so Amir says there's this 70 to 100 is the leeway he's doing it, and he, and he says that... Oh, I thought you said 80 or yeah, no. no, 100. I might have said 80 if I didn't. No, 100. 100. You so said 100. Well, that's 70, quite a span. That is, 30 right. years? Yeah, so 70, well, he said at beginning at 70 to 100 is the span. So it starts at 70. But it finishes at 100. But you're right; it is in the Psalms, is that? Uh, yeah, and that's what they go by for the for the the generation. God's you know? days or years. Right. So, but then you don't get into trying to pick dates and go, oh, a generation, because you know, that's what they did when they thought Jesus was coming back in 1988. Yeah. Is they said, oh, okay, the Belfour Declaration was 1948. Biblical generation is 40 years. Oh, Jesus is coming in 1988. I mean, I still got the books in my office. You know, 88 reasons why Jesus is coming back. Well, he did come back. And then, all of a sudden, 89 reasons why Jesus <laughs> did come back. And we're at 2021. Guess what? He still isn't back. <laughs> they have that up, so we're going to catch it on one of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, uh, no doubt about it. So, so, you know, you don't get into that predicting kind of a thing, you know, number one. And again, a Jewish calendar, 366 days. And I just checked my notes. We just began on the Jewish calendar uh, the year 5,871. So the, this is not 2020 to an Orthodox Jew. This is the year 5,700 or 820 because they didn't adopt the Gregorian calendar. So when you're, so when these guys are doing these numbers, they're applying, you know, these this Gentile thought to these numbers, 
And God don't operate that way, you know. So I just thought it was interesting. But so he says 70 to 100, and it's been 70, you know, 73 years in what we have in here. Okay, anyone else? All right, so let's go ahead and go on here. So then he says this, verse 33. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. And obviously, I think that's self-explanatory. You know, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. But he says, what I have spoken, it is eternal. Okay? Okay, so now 34, 35, 36, 7, 37, 38, we'll leave it at this. The warning to watch for his coming. All right? Uh, so in verse 34, but take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing and drunkenness and the cares of this life, and that day come upon you, or come on you unexpectedly. Now, I'm going to throw out some thoughts here for you concerning that 34th verse. First thing he says, do not let your hearts, you know, be weighed down. It also can be burdened. Do not be overburdened. Do not be depressed when you see these things happening. The carousing, obviously, is the chasing around, living a riotous lifestyle. Uh, also means self-indulgence, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, being weighed down by worldly cares pertaining to this life, lest that day come upon you suddenly. And I, and, and I think the, what I want to share with you here, let me get, make sure I get the exact word, the cares of this life that this day come. Okay, the term unexpectedly in the Greek means this. So that it does not come upon you like a snare, a trap, or a trick. Unexpectedly is suddenly. Because this is how birds and beasts are caught unaware. They're just going along and all of a sudden the trap goes off and they're caught and they were unaware of it. He says, so that's the idea. He says, don't get yourself caught up like it's in a trap or a snare, not paying attention to what's going on around you. And again, he's talking to the Jews. I think he's talking to that, those people that are going to be that 144,000 left. Because like I said, you know, uh, we'll be going to be with the Lord you know, when the rapture takes place. But he's telling them, you need to watch what's going on. So here, let me throw in another little thought there. Okay, remember, the rapture takes place, and that begins the seven-year tribulation period. All right? The first three and a half years of the tribulation period are going to be actually pretty good years. You know? It's just, they're, they're getting life back together with the Christians being gone. Life gets organized. One world ruler rises up. The anti, we know he's the Antichrist. They won't know that. And he rises up and he'll bring peace. He'll bring safety. There'll be a unified currency, unified countries. Everybody's going to be all under one heading. You know, things are going to be looking really good. So that first three and a half years was great. It's that last three and a half years that really you got to watch for. You know, that's where he shows us to self. That's where he says, I want to be worshipped. That's where you, when you get into the book of Revelation, you see the mark of the beast. You see the Antichrist, the false prophets. You know, all of this stuff starts taking place. And that's that, that last three and a half years. So he says, you know, so that's, this is how I put it together. So don't let that first three and a half years after the Lord comes back with the rapture and takes us out of here, that everybody's going to think, oh, great, Christians are gone. <laughs> we can do what we want to. No one's going to tell us, you know, you shouldn't be doing that. God don't like it, you know. And uh, they're going to think it's great. And that's how they're going to fall asleep. That is how they're going to get caught in this trap. They're, gonna, they're just going to go and say, hey, you know, things aren't really too bad. And then he says, man, after that, Bam, here it comes. <clears throat> oh, I, I thought about what's going on today with, with well, like, again, I, I don't want to bring politics into this, but it, it comes in naturally. We got a certain sect in the country that wants to, wants to give everybody free stuff. No accountability for work to earn it, okay? Would that bring in a period of time to work? Maybe it works for a while, enough to sucker everybody in to think that, uh, hey, we don't have any cares. There's, or we got everything for free. All we have to do is, is to pay homage to the person that's providing it, and we, we, we can live a carefree life. 
So that's what it looks sure. like to me. Right. And right. then the bottom, or, the, or whatever falls out of it, falls out. Right. The reality sets in, but it's too late. Well, what's really going to hit them, and, and, and you see things lining up with, you know, nations around the world being so deep in debt. Well, that's what I'm saying. There's, there's I mean, no how out. How do you I get mean, out? Unless yeah, how do you get out? Unless we, you, we, we don't have anything. We're not accountable right. anymore. We'll and you go to digital public. currencies, right. you know, and, currency, you know right. and that kind of thing. One of the things that they're talking about, you know, you know how, the, how the world twists stuff around to make it sound good. You know, they'll say, look, if we go to, go to digital currency, uh, the drug dealers can't be using cash anymore because that would be useless. Bitcoin. You know, yeah, Bitcoin. 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 You know, that's, that's the that's digital. Bitcoin. So, yeah. so I'm just saying, you know, the drug dealers are going to say, hey, you know, they're, they're going to say, look, the drug dealers can't, they're dealing right now in American dollars and cash. Right. Uh, you know, you, they don't, can't do that anymore. Uh, you know, the, you don't need cash. You can do transactions from all around the world. You know, when I was, uh, last time I was on the missions trip, you know, and, and I was in India, uh, man, I had my, my, my debit card. And uh, then I'd stand there in an in, in airport in Rome or someplace and bang, boom. And then, because there was a Wi-Fi, seconds, seconds later, my phone dings. And it's U.S. Bank, purchase made. Seconds. And I'm, I'm halfway around the world, you know, that kind of stuff. So there'll be this, and the thing is, is part of it's true. I mean, that was convenient. You know, I wasn't carrying euros. I didn't have to whip out a lot of money. I didn't have to exchange anything. I just... Done. Okay, you bought it. Good. Yeah, enjoy your rich espresso. You know, <laughs> knock yourself out. And so that's what it looks like. But the other part of it is, is that they knew where I was. They knew the time. They knew the name of the store. <laughs> and they knew when I bought because it came up two seconds later on my phone. <laughs> you know, so I'm saying all that. So there's always going to be this. This positive side is something that can also be negative, and that's kind of how it works around there a little bit. And so you'll see this. So that first three and a half years, I mean, there's going to be unity. Everybody's going to have the same leadership. Every, everything's going to be all the same, and it's going to look good. What's going to bury them isn't just the, you know, the, the digital currency or whatever it is. I mean, it really is the Antichrist showing, showing that he wants to be worshipped. And then taking it to the point like it does in Revelation, I think it's 13 or somewhere up in there, you know, either you take the mark or you die. You know, either you take the mark or you don't eat. You know, you don't, you can't purchase anything. You know, then that's going to change everything. And then that's what's going to really make it, you know, have them wake up to the fact that this is going the wrong direction. But don't you think reality will set in on these people that they made a mistake and they're looking for a way out? And it'll either be take the mark or die and, and, and they won't know what to do. I don't know. I, they don't seem to get it yet, so <laughs> you know they don't seem to get it yet. I mean, they, they, they have to figure: why should we have to die when we had it so good? What, no why should we have to give our lives up when we right. had it so see, good? See, but you're it? you're thinking from a man that has well, lived completely I'm free yeah, his whole right. seventy years of his life doing what he wants to. But that I is think, all gone. Yeah, I know it, but but that's what's going to. The mindset's going to be of these people. It has to be. They, they don't have anything else to fall back on. Well, what they're going to end up doing is following the Antichrist. I mean, they're going to take the mark, you know, because yeah, if you know, that's what if, I'm saying. yeah, they're yeah. going to have right. They're going to have to yeah, take it. Right. They're going to have to take yeah. it because it's like, you know, if if you got a family of four and you got to feed them, are you going to look at your children and be like, I'm not going to feed you because I'm not taking the mark? You know, you're right. I mean, so in that point, yeah, you're exactly right. They they. By the time they get it, it'll be way too late for them to really figure out what's going on. And of course, as Christians today, if we tell people about the last days and all this other stuff, oh, they're like, I've heard that for years, you know, just be quiet, you know, yeah, he's coming back, da, 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 you know. But they don't read First Peter, where Peter says, well, you know, there's people that count slack, but, you know, God's not slack in his promise. You know, a thousand years is a day to God, and a day is a thousand years to God. In other words, God's eternal, there's no time frame of him. Yeah, so yeah, that is correct, Ellie. Okay, so let's go on here. We'll finish up these and then we'll be we'll finish up our time here together. So in verse 35, I talked about the snare, right? Uh, you know, so for it will it will come as a snare on all the earth and dwell in the face of the whole earth. And that's why I said trick trap caught in unexpectedly in 34. Snare is there, you know, again being a trap type of a thing. Uh, in there, so verse 36, so watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things. Now notice, that will come to pass, again, this is during the tribulation period, 
and to stand before the Son of God. So that, that's not the rapture. You know, that is the second coming. That is the last days during the tribulation period. And again, you and I are looking at it going, wait a minute, all the Christians will be out of here. Yeah, but the 144,000 Jews will not be because they won't get become following Christ until after the rapture takes place and they see what happened. So that's how that pulls, if you keep that in mind, that's how it gets all pulled together uh, in there. Okay, verse, uh, let me read 36 out of the Amplified. Uh, keep awake then and watch at all times. Be discreet, attentive, ready, praying that you may have full strength and ability and be counted worthy to escape all these things. And it does mean to flee, to escape, to run to safety. Okay, it's exactly what it means. Uh, taken and taken together that you will take a place and stand, that you will find a place and you will stand in the presence of the Son of Man. That's the idea here. He says, pray that there's a safe place to go to. And of course, everybody believes that they'll all run to, uh, what's that? Petra. Petra. I should remember that. That yeah. was my favorite Jordan. group. Yeah. <laughs> that was my favorite group. Petra. <laughs> and so that's what it has in there. So that's what he's talking about. So now look at 37 and 38. Now, in the daytime, he was teaching in the temple, but at night he went out and stayed on the Mount, of, called, the Mount called Olivet. Then early in the morning, all of the people came to hear him in the temple. All right. So, and then this was... And my, my, final, my final little note here is that the other reason why the Jews hated him, not only did he obviously cut them down and, you know, call them snakes, vipers, hypocrites, you know, you don't make friends doing that. Uh, you know, obviously, people were following him. I mean, Jesus was having crowds of thousands, thousands, and they were following, following him, and they didn't like that either. And then you'll see, and we'll do it just Verse 2, we'll do it next week. Uh, verse 2 of chapter 22, and the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him. But they feared the people. They said, we got to kill this guy. How are we going to do it? But they couldn't do it openly because the crowds were there. So we'll look at chapter 22 next week and we'll take you through. And I'm gonna, I got a really long, extensive teaching on a little bit better understanding of the Passover. Uh, sometimes it's called Pesach, which is the same. So if you see Pesach, Passover, it's going to be the same. And we'll look at uh, chapter 22 then uh, next week. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Man, I appreciate you coming out, taking the time to come out on a, on a chilly Wednesday night. Um, uh, and, of course, the rain and snow stuff starts tomorrow. Huh? I don't know. <laughs> Hey, you're more accurate than some of the people on television. I just want you to know that. I'm thinking, how can he be right? These people got like 20 different radar things they can go from, and they're still wrong. Because they uh, 